Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Imper Kasangane of... This sounds very gay. Jack Slack, it's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday the 27th of November after a very weird weekend. Uh, we're probably going to have about 2,000 people in for this episode, but PFL had their big end-of-season crowning of champions event, and the UFC, who will counter... Bellator's biggest cards with absolute dog shit and massively outperformed them. Didn't even bother this time. Not even a Mackenzie Dern main event at the Apex for this. Um, but it was interesting. And it, it's, you know, PFL is more talked about at the moment for what they aren't doing than what they are. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more about their potential. Having just bought Bellator and announced a load of stuff that people went, that's really stupid about should we lead with that or should we go with the fights themselves? We'll talk about the, the... Okay, so PFL, if you don't know, it's the Professional Fighting League or Professional Fight League. That's not a good sign that I don't know that. But uh, they were basically the World Series of Fighting before that, uh, until the World Series of Fighting ran out of money and they rebranded after filing for bankruptcy or whatever. They are the same people and they do the same stupid things a lot of the time. You know, my famous example from years ago was when they did a, an event in Madison Square Garden on New Year's Eve because, of course, hiring the venue was fairly cheap because no one would be there on New Year's Eve. But they were closely associated with Ali Abdelaziz. They got Justin Gaethje, Mar Marlon Marias. They had some really good talent come through. PFL, not so much, but it was this idea of doing tournaments over seasons like you would in any other sport. Uh, it's an odd one because, obviously, combat sports don't, really work like that and can't really work like that because if you have I don't know I do I don't know anything about ball sports really but if you say like there's 15 guys in the top 15 of the lightweights actually in the modern rankings there's 16 guys in the top 15 because the champion isn't ranked uh, but if you have 15 guys they all fight each other once you know that's a whole career you've had just in a year uh, and you wouldn't get it done in a year obviously because it takes too long between fights and guys have injuries because fighting is a sport where more than any other, you know, the the goal is to injure your opponent so that he can't fight you anymore. Ideally, you want to knock him out nice and clean and his brain doesn't experience any damage and he's not going to have a worse life as a result of it. I think that's what most fighters feel about their odd profession. But, uh, you know, it, it tears people down very, very quickly. So you can't do a round robin every year. You know, the, the PFL tournament is, what is it, eight guys each year? But they have to fight a lot. So Impacas Angadai is the guy that everyone's talking about from this tournament because he uh, didn't have a great run in the UFC, went 2-2, two and two, got cut, ended up in PFL, had his first fight there in March, has fought five times there this year. However, he has won the million-dollar prize, which is probably more than he would ever make fighting in the UFC. And, of course, he was the, on the receiving end of the uh, highlight reel knockout by Hakeem Buckley. Um, jump jump spinning back kick off a parried front kick and uh, you know they play that a million times every time there's a UFC hype package on Buckley isn't making any more money off that Impa's not making any more money off that but Impa's gone on to earn this million dollars over the course of a year and even though Buckley is a star for the UFC in, in as, as far as they have stars you know he's well liked among the people who casually watch the UFC people know who he is they can use him to stock up cards and uh, put on entertaining fights at the, the apex but I would very much doubt he's earned, you know, before tax, a million dollars in the UFC since then, including all his performance bonuses. So there's the intrigue. You know, that's part of why we're talking about it. But like I said, you have to do a lot of fighting, five fights in a year. And in order to do that, they have to do these weird things where they have a rule set that doesn't allow elbows. So it's a different form of MMA off the bat. You know, Derek Brunson just took a fight over there. Um, having just left the UFC, and it was it was just sort of a quote-unquote super fight, but it was him versus Ray Cooper. There wasn't much super about it. Um, but he said, like, I think I would have got the finish if I had elbows allowed. It was his, And the really strange thing is that people have been asking them, why don't you allow elbows in the finals? Because it's understandable if you've got quick turnarounds, you want to minimise the cuts. A lot of elbows just cause cuts because a cut is a very easy way to get a fight um cancelled or you know um not even made you know if you go to your medical and you have a bigger cut under your eye unless you're in uh, abu dhabi where they, where they just let you fight with stuff and a massive cut under your eye um they're probably not going to let you fight 
However, once you're in the finals and there's no tournament until next year, probably next March it starts, uh, why not just let people fight with elbows like it's proper MMA? And Don Davis, the uh, the guy who is now in charge of PFL and Bellator, uh, said that they don't want to do different rules for the finals than they would for the main fights. But the finals are title fights. This isn't like Bellator where the tournament is, where every time the champion fights in the tournament, it's a five-rounder because the title's on the line. This is you're fighting for a title at the end of it, a tournament title. And the final fight is a five-rounder versus three rounds for every other fight in the tournament. If you're fighting almost twice as long, in the finals, you're already fighting basically under a different rule set. It's like Zabit Magomed Sharipov, killer under three rounds. Never going to be successful under five rounds, didn't even try. Makwan Amakani, <laughs> well, he wasn't even a killer under three rounds. Um, Abus Magomed, I mean, that, that was part of the fun of this. Like, Abus used to be in PFL, and obviously he, got, he, he lost to some 45-year-old man, knocked him out on the first punch. But if he'd got to the final he'd have been fighting for five rounds. And the idea of a bus fighting for five rounds, I mean, I can't in good conscience support it because he might die. And then PFL announced that they've got Bellator now and they're going to do super fights. They said they're not bringing in a bantamweight tournament. They're not bringing in a middleweight tournament. And everyone went, fucking why? <laughs> Bellator's best fighters are at bantamweight. Uh, you know, they got, they got some okay middleweights. They got a very successful uh, middleweight champion in the form of... Uh, Johnny Bedlam, Jaunty Plimbum. But no, so the, apparently what it seems to be is that they're going to keep Bellator going as its own thing and then they want to do champ versus champ super fights. So that's going to be the theme of this episode because like, any PFL champion versus a Bellator champion, you're like, is it a super fight or is it just a fight? Um, and how would these PFL champions do against UFC champions and how would Bellator champions do against UFC champions? So we'll get, all in, we'll get into all that today because that's what I'm promising in the uh, episode title. But we had... Five champions crowned, heavyweight, welterweight, light heavyweight, featherweight, and women's featherweight. One of these things is not a real division. <laughs> but it was mixed. It was a mixed bag of, like, impressive and unimpressive. Um, Jesus Pinedo won the featherweight title, and that was the first one on the card. And he's sort of come out of nowhere because he lost his first fight in the tournament by split decision. Then he fought Brendan Lochnane, who has been a big favourite for people who like fighters outside the UFC because Brendan Lochnane had the bizarre UFC career of getting uh, one fight in the UFC back in 2012, winning on the Contender Series in 2019 and not getting in, and then just continuing to have a, a pretty great career outside the UFC and obviously winning the um, tournament last year and getting the million dollars. He's a really fun guy. He's a great striker. He beat Marlon Marais. They, you know, they brought Marlon Marais over for the first round this year, and uh, he knocked out Marlon Marais. But Jesus Pinedo knocked him out, and then Pinedo's looked great since. Knocked out Bubba Jenkins, who was the finalist from last year, and then um, he for the final of the tournament, he rematched Braga, who beat him by split decision the first time around. Good competitive fight. Third round, he, he realised, like, it's a really obvious moment. You see him notice that Braga's ducking in to his chest every time he, every time he steps in swinging. So he starts to, like level change and get Braga doing it. And then he throws a, an uppercut that sort of goes towards him, kind of like that Kopolov one we were talking about. Or did I talk about it on the Kopolov Filthy Catcher's Guide? Kopolov likes a, an uppercut that goes across his... Kopolov likes to throw a rear hand uppercut that goes sort of straight out towards the opponent and, and checks their chin. It's like a it's sort of like a straight that goes between your chests and upwards. And um, he caught Braga with that, wobbled him, followed up with a jumping knee and some punches for a, for a KO. And it was, yeah, it was really impressive. And... He's another one who's had a two-fight UFC career, won a fight against Devin Powell back in 2018, lost a fight against John McDacy in 2019, never came back. And these seem to be, you know, it's uh, him and Impa and um, Brendan Lochnane, and there are, you, you don't, I think people expect, like, big names who've bombed out of the UFC, like Brunson, to do really well in, in PFL, but it tends to be people who've just, like, never really got started in the UFC. Maybe they had like a, a, a shaky start and the UFC, well, they never gained any attention really because they it was so early on and the UFC just went, nah, we don't want you back. And they've come to maturity in PFL and it's quite impressive. And these are the ones that are quite exciting because they make you think like, yeah, I watch guys look unimpressive on the undercards and then I know that, you know, a lot of them don't come back to the UFC. But if they've been allowed to stick around, they might be better. You know, they might be really good. So they got that featherweight fight out of the way pretty quickly. Jesus Pinedo, I mean, they, they then got Patricio Pitbull in the ring to do the stare down with Pinedo. Um, Patricio, you know, for the uh, champ versus champ super fight. 
Honestly, though, Pinedo's look good, and and Patricio's sort of waning in his career. Um, he he did something pretty dumb in his last couple. He went down another weight class to bantamweight to fight Sergio Pettis, and looked bad um, because what his you know his thing is being surprisingly quick as an undersized featherweight, but also surprisingly strong. He's he's strong enough that he can handle these guys who are towering over him, but he's quick enough that he can get in and crack him with big shots. Not a big combination puncher. And as soon as he met someone who was about the same size and, and speed as him, he had a lot of trouble. And then three weeks notice, he goes back up to lightweight, two weight classes up, gets knocked out by Suzuki and Ryzen. And that was just silly. There was no reason for, reason, there was no reason for him to do that. I imagine he was doing a favor to the promotion. I imagine he was doing a solid for Scott Coker. But then back at his normal weight, he might just smoke Pineda. Pineda might not even be that good. Um, UFC champion, that's Volkanovski, who oh, 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 picked a harsh start here because you're talking about like Jesus Pinedo, surprisingly decent featherweight outside the UFC versus one of the best fighters we've ever seen ever at any weight. And Pitbull versus Volkanovski, Pitbull gets murked. I just can't see. I mean, there were a, a few a few fights ago, there were people convincing themselves that Pitbull had it for Volkanovski, but it really is just the surprising speed and the big power. So after that fight, they had uh, Derek Brunson versus Ray Cooper III. Ray Cooper III has won two of these tournaments back in the day. So he won $2 million and he stopped caring. <laughs> he um, lost to Carlos Leal after missing weight. And Carlos Leal looked really good. That was back in 2022. Um, took one more fight and knocked out Brett Cooper quite quickly. Then he took this fight against Brunson. Again, upper weight class this time. No longer at Wales weight. He's up at middleweight to let Brunson have a fight because Brunson's a middleweight and they don't have a middleweight division. And um, he missed weight on that. And Don Davis is as much as said. He's just, you know, not bothered with fighting anymore. Um, but he did, he got his leg elevated along the fence with, in a single leg and he knocked down Brunson on one leg. <laughs> it's just, you know, people keep going on about how Brunson's chin's cracked and that one was a bit concerning. But most of it was just Brunson holding him down and um, roughing him up a little bit. But really without elbows, he was denied the, the short range um, thing that punishes people for staying on the bottom. There was a cool moment where Brunson shot and um, Cooper dug an underhook and basically knee picked him while he was on his, or knee tapped him while he was on his knees and got the top position. And that was impressive because he's a welterweight handling a big, strong wrestler at middleweight, but um, who has been as high as light heavyweight, I believe. And I imagine that's where Brunson will compete, as PFL have just said they're not going to do a middleweight tournament. Um, well, if you want that easy Millie. But otherwise, an unremarkable fight. No uh, Brunson running in with his chin out, throwing big shots. It was a very tactical, um, restrained Brunson performance. Kayla Harrison versus Aspen Ladd. This was the first thing on the poster. <laughs> it was just such a weird decision. Be like, pay $50. Here's Kayla Harrison versus Aspen Ladd. Aspen Ladd, I've got a soft spot for Aspen Ladd because I quite liked her back in the day. I thought she was an interesting talent. And, you know, she's got a strong ground game. Um, and she had a decent left hook at the time and could hit pretty hard. And she'd worked out the magic secret of women's MMA that there is a totally different standard to get a TKO stoppage on the ground. If you scream while throwing punches, the refs, predominantly male refs, will uh, stop the fight and be like, oh my God, she's killing that girl. <laughs> Even if you're not landing punches. Two of her stoppages in the UFC are just her screaming on top of someone and missing. And then you remember Brock Lesnar almost killing Shane Carwin and gassing himself out in the process. And <laughs> the refs not stopping that. Um, but I thought she had talent and she'd sort of like squandered it by not improving that much. And also just, you know, uh, clearly had issues either with professionalism or just diet generally, because she kept missing weight and she started at bantamweight and this fight was up at, well, not lightweight, but 150, which is insane. There's not a woman alive except Cyborg and Kayla Harrison who should be fighting at 150. Women's lightweight shouldn't exist. Women's featherweight should be open and just be women's heavyweight. Um, and Aspen Ladd should be able to make women's bantamweight. She's not enormous. Uh, she looked dumpy as hell in this fight. And Kayla Harrison is an absolute powerhouse. And one of the things that I do like about Kayla Harrison, um, well, firstly, the striking in this one, I expected bad from Aspen Ladd and I expected bad from Kayla Harrison. Honestly, not that bad. Uh, Aspen Ladd was throwing good ones, twos and threes. And um, Kayla Harrison was throwing nice body kicks from Southpaw and good left straights. And they were doing a pretty decent job. But what I like about Kayla Harrison is that she went to work with ATT, um, American Top Team, with Mike Brown. And, and uh, you know, there's so many good fighters out there now. that, And there always have been, actually. 
Uh, it's one of the big teams. If you're very serious about MMA, you know, you go there and you're not the best in the room and you're going to have a hard time, but you will get a lot better. And that's the big difference between Kayla Harrison and Ronda Rousey. I mean, Ronda Rousey also very different styles of judo to begin with. I mean, Ronda, Ronda Rousey had a big focus on the armbar anyway, but and ground fighting is, is an aspect of uh, modern judo that is kind of, you could take it or leave it. You could be a groundwork specialist or you could just not bother. But what I do like about Kayla Harrison is that she's learned, one, to cage wrestle, two, to level change for takedowns. Because the moment that they banned leg grabs in uh, judo, obviously there was no reason to be level changing. And Ronda Rousey, when she came to MMA, never bothered to learn to level change. Level changing into people, like, level changing gets you into clinches. You don't even have to do a full double leg. You just have to bend at the knees or the waist and hit the opponent with your chest and then stand up. But she never developed that. She was always just, like, left hook and run into the clinch. And obviously, um, Holly Holm had a field day getting away from her. And uh, when she fought Amanda Nunes, it was, like, just running on to right straight over and over again because she never moved her fucking head. She didn't have head movement, if you will. But that's probably from training at a, a camp full of clowns with uh, Edmund and, well, Edmund. There's no others there. <laughs> He's never produced another good fighter except uh, Edmund Shabazian, who, again, has not lived up to his potential. But yeah, so Kayla Harrison hit a really nice um, double leg in the second round of this one. Aspenland, when she was on the bottom, she was, you know, she got stuck in bottom of uh, closed guard for a, quite a while, and that was not great. It wasn't as bad for her because obviously elbows not legal but it did mean that she uh lost whole rounds she was doing a good job of like going to the scissor scissoring her legs framing off kate harrison and getting onto a hand and trying to get up the interesting parts of this one were the two um sweeps or sweep attempts by aspen lad uh from well you don't you won't you wouldn't see them in traditional jiu-jitsu or uh you know grappling competition because you sort of have to be turning your back or being taken down to hit him. She did the the Sakuraba Kimura. Um, I'm going to call it a sumigeishi because people call the throw sumigeishi, not because it's a butterfly sweep, and I'm calling all butterfly sweeps sumigeishi, which is a controversial issue in the grappling world at the moment. But uh, Sakuraba, go watch Filthy Casual's Guide to Sakuraba. Get, he would do it from the knees, from the turtle. He'd get the Kimura grip on his opponent when they had the back body lock on him. He'd stand up with one leg, and then as he brought the other leg up, he'd turn back into them, sit down, and sweep them overhead with a butterfly hook on the wrong side of their body. And that's the classic Sakuraba Sumigeshi. And she did that while being taken down by Kayla Harrison off that really good level change. Oh, no, that was while she was trying to come up. She was coming up to the turtle, and then Kayla Harrison was, like, bulldogging her back down. And she just turned around, gri uh, grabbed the Kimura, and sent her overhead. And she actually scrambled up to her feet off that one. And then the other one was a, a Ricardo Lama-style one. She was getting taken down. She reached over the back, and she put the wrong side butterfly hook in, sat to her back, and, and uh, elevated Kayla Harrison overhead, came up onto the front headlock, and started taking Kayla Harrison's back, and sort of blew it because she did it very messily and sat back on her own leg. Did the Rashad stanky leg on herself. But those two techers were really interesting. Uh, and it, it's the transition between turtling or standing and sitting back down to perform the butterfly sweep. Because with a butterfly sweep, it's very hard to butterfly sweep someone when you're flat on your back. It'll happen like Benoit Saint-Denis did it to um, Frivola the other day, which was a very slick sweep, which I, I broke down on the um, post-fight article. But if you watch really good butterfly sweepers, people like uh, Leo Santos back in the day, or I mean Gordon Ryan now, Marcelo Garcia, a lot of it is about sitting up into the opponent, getting the underhook, and then falling with them to create that momentum. If you're both already lying flat, it's very hard to do. The great thing about like turning back into the opponent from the turtle or as they're taking you down is that you have both your weight falling towards the floor anyway. So then you can, if you can get that hook in and elevate the legs, you're, you're laughing. But then if we've got any catch wrestling nerds in the, uh, in the audience, they'll be going, well, yeah, it's because it's not a butterfly sweep. It's an elevator, Jack. So yeah, oh, I, I, su I surprised myself by spending a little bit of time on that fight. I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, I think... Yeah, Lad's going to be one of those ones where I'm going to... She could turn her career around. She won't, probably. But uh, it's going to be one of those ones where I go like, oh, there was that girl who did some interesting things a little while ago. And she'll make for good, like, weird inside technique YouTube video in five, ten years' time. Um, like when I did my Roman Coppola one last week because there wasn't a lot going on. I did a Roman Coppola one instead of the boycast. And people were like, 
why? He's lost very recently. <laughs> it's like, because he was interesting. He does an interesting thing or a couple of interesting things. I wanted to talk about him. Um, but yeah, Kayla Harrison, I also sort of feel for because she is very good uh, and she has legitimate skills. And if she were a bit lighter, like Ronda Rousey, she'd have like a, a competitive division to prove it against. But she's so much bigger that there's just no one for her to fight. And then she did fight Larissa Pacheco, I mean, three times, I think. And on the last time, Larissa Pacheco beat her, which was a massive upset. And, you know, basically she only has the cyborg fight to look for. I mean, she could get the Pacheco rematch, but, you know, is that hype? I think that's only hype for, like, the few people who saw the first one. Uh, you know, so she's got, like, her whole career is geared towards getting this cyborg match. And it's just been, like, impossible to put together. However, Cyborg is with, or was with Bellator. So there's a chance they get it together now, but I think Don Davis has already said they'd rather do Larissa Pacheco uh, versus Cyborg first because of the champ versus champ thing, which certainly makes your organisation look more legitimate. A rare good call on the part of uh, Don Davis. To get, look forward to me saying Don Davis a lot because I haven't had any cause to say it until recently. And now he's the new Scott Coker. Impa Kasangane versus uh, Josh Silvera. I mean, I, I've been raving about Impa Kasangane because I'm just so happy for him to have um, got that money. Uh, and I think, you know, this is the thing, like, is this a profitable exercise for the PFL? Probably not, but they do have the ESPN money and they are Saudi-backed, so there's money pouring in. If everyone was fairly compensated, would Impa Kasangane be like a million-dollar fighter? Probably not. But fighters should be able to fight for this kind of money. Certainly in the UFC, who are, they outperformed all other fight promoters put together from boxing, kickboxing, and MMA. I don't know why I included kickboxing, it's a joke, but, uh, you know, last year or uh, whatever year they just recently released for the lawsuit. So the money is very much there in the UFC. Um, to pay people who, like, you know, guys who are in the top 10, top 15 should be able to be full-time athletes and devote themselves to the sport properly. But what Impa Kasangane did in winning five fights in a year is crazy. Um, so, yeah, more than great to see him uh, compensated like that. Josh Silvera, I, I only just found out that he's Conan Silvera's son. Conan Silvera, back in the day, a lot of people probably only know him for um, his fights with Sakuraba. Fought Sakuraba twice in one night because in the first fight, uh, Sakuraba dived for a single leg while Conan Silvera was swinging at him along the fence. And uh, Big John McCarthy called it off. And this was very rare because it was so far back. It was 1997. Refs could admit they were wrong. <laughs> Big John McCarthy could admit he was wrong. And uh, they actually overruled it as a no contest. But that was also partly to do with someone else not being able to continue in the tournament. So they met again in the final of the tournament. And uh, Sakuraba submitted him um, with an armbar, which was amazing because Conan Silvera was a heavyweight. He's 6'3", 250 pounds. And Sakuraba could make like welterweight today. And Silvera was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And Sakuraba was a professional wrestler. But he had a few more fights. Um, you know, Patrick Smith, Maurice Smith, Dan Seven, Wes Sims. Never fought in the UFC again. Um, that was UFC Japan. But he then went to ATT and became one of their, their coaches. He was, uh, you know, American top team, one of their, like, old guard. And he's been there forever. And basically, you will see him in the corner constantly for any night of fights you watch with decent fighters on and his son has proven to be a bit of a finisher he's um, run through his opponents in the tournament pretty quick but then he met Impa and uh, aside from one takedown which I think was in the second round um, he, he worked hard to get this takedown and then Impa just jumped up and he went oh okay it's gonna be like that so mainly this fight was Impa landing the right straight to the body and the left hook over the top on the, uh, the Southpaw Silvera uh, for five rounds but he looked in great shape despite going up to light heavyweight um, you know, the, the way this works is that they look great and then you go, oh, well, I'm so glad they're having success outside the UFC. And then last year, I think three of the major fighters from the tournaments tested positive for steroids in not, uh, not even random drug tests, just scheduled drug tests. Rob Wilkinson had a great run and was looking great and doing great things for himself. I think he won the Millie and uh, then it came out he'd been roiding. But then, you know, if there's a million dollars on the line and the testing's not very good, why not? Only problem is that it can be quite expensive. <laughs> um, what's left of this card? Oh, the one that really impressed me actually was Magomed Magomed Kerimov versus Sadabusai or Sadabusi. Um, Sadabusi, last year's champion. Magomed Kerimov already had a win over him by decision, so they knew each other quite well. 
which is one of the fun things about the tournaments. But yeah, this is the Dagestani that I like at the moment. Uh, Magomed, Magomed, Magomed Kerimov. Um, really cool trips from the clinch. And pretty basic stuff on the feet applied well specifically for C. Uh, Sadabu C goes southpaw and throws the left high kick and body kick a lot. So Magomed Kerimov, who I'm going to call Kerimov from now on because that's a lot to say, um, came out orthodox and he was using the cross check. So picking up his left leg with his shin pointed across his body. Um, which is a bit of a commitment, so you don't see it that much, particularly in um, sports where people are, people are kicking a lot because they'll they'll throw, uh, they'll fake with their left hip and then they'll step through and cut kick you with their right leg. But nobody does that in MMA. Um, but if you've got someone who's left, if you're an orthodox fighter and the opponent's left leg is giving you trouble, no matter if they're southpaw or orthodox, um, cross check is a great way to sort of shut down a lot of their options because because your leg is being pulled across your body. Uh, you're not checking on the same side with your right leg, with your back leg. You're checking with your lead leg across yourself. Um, you're sort of taking away your center line as well. So the really famous example of this working terrifically, Semi Schilt had a great, uh, he's orthodox, he's nine feet tall. He had a great step up left front kick to the body, step up left round kick to the head. And they played into each other and guys would start crumpling over trying to block the body shot. And then the kick would come over the top and kick him in the head. Bader Harry, the first time he beat him, just cross checks. He picks his leg up, takes whether it's a front kick or a round kick, it hits his leg, and then he steps in deep and throws the, the overhand right. And um, that's what Magomed Kirimov was doing here. He had the added bonus that when he picked his leg up, he, he did it so often that um, a lot of the time Sadabu wasn't kicking. So then he'd just stomp on the lead leg. And sometimes he'd even get the lead leg, he'd stomp on the lead leg as Sadabu was kicking with the other leg. So he'd knock him over just with a side kick on the standing leg. Tony Jar style. If you remember that Tony Jar fight from the film that wasn't uh, Ong back, where he breaks all those people's bones by stamping on their legs. But the trips from the clinch were beautiful. He kept going to the over-under, quite an upright over-under, and um, he did that thing that Islam Makachev did to um, Armin Sarukian, where you have the underhook and the overhook, the opponent has the underhook and the overhook, you reach across and grab the opponent's overhooking hand with a cross grip, so you can use your underhook and that wrist grip to pull them into the foot sweep. Then there was another one where he caught uh, a leg, and Sadabusi started trying to turn away and, and rip his leg out, because obviously you're not wearing wrestling shoes. Turning away and pulling your leg is a great way to get out of things. Um, think Woodley versus Maya. But Magomed Kerimov uh, reaches over and, and like overwraps the, the leg that he's chasing and trips the far leg. It's so cool. Uh, I should write something about it. Tr I tried to write something about this event, but it was a nightmare getting clips from DAZN. But yeah, he just kept moving him back onto the fence by cross-checking and then throwing the, the jab overhand. Um, hit some lovely throws and sweeps, and uh, eventually dinged Sadabu Z and got a guillotine choke for the win. Um, so I'm going to have to go back and watch all of Magomed Kerimov's fights because he impressed me. Larissa Pacheco versus Marina Moknatkina. That's a hilarious name. Um, Moknatkina was crap, but Larissa Pacheco looked awful in this fight. She was allowed to tee off on a girl for five rounds. She's supposed to be a massive hitter, and she didn't do anything to her. The only cool moment of this fight was that in round one, um, Larissa Pacheco was threatening a standing guillotine along the fence, and uh, eventually she pulled her down into a front headlock and started running to the back, and Marina did a beautiful victor roll, grabbed both legs, rolled through her legs, into the knee bar, and very nearly finished Pacheco. But the rest of the fight was awful. Uh, Henan Ferreira versus Dennis Goltov. Henan Ferreira finally wins the millie. Um, good things came from fake tapping against... Uh, Fabricio Verdum back in 2021 when Verdum entered the tournament and we were all like, well, Verdum's still a world-class heavyweight. There aren't any other good heavyweights outside the, of the UFC. This will be an easy million dollars for him. Henan Ferreira gets caught in a triangle, does a fake tap. Verdum lets go before the ref says let go. Ref didn't see the tap. Henan Ferreira pounds him out. It's overturned later on video review, but uh, obviously Fabricio Verdum still got knocked out, so he can't continue on the tournament uh, you know, in terms of medical clearance. But Ferreira didn't win that year. And he's got a really weird record because he's got like 19 fights and three of them are no contests. But it was him versus Denis Goldsov in the final and Denis Goldsov easily took him down and uh, passed to Mount in the first round. Comes out second round, Denis Goldsov throws a jab and then Ferreira throws a right hand across the top of it, knocks him out. Hilarious. And then Ferreira in... Well, I mean, this is the thing. They had like... They had too many people popping up in the corner all the way through. The, the Larissa Pacheco fight, Jake Paul was on constantly. And I just felt like, if 
Fair play, Jake Paul's actually earning his money here. He's having it to sit here and watch and comment on a terrible fight. Um, but they had Wiz Khalifa for every round of one of the fights. But they had Ryan Bader popping up to talk about uh, this fight between the two heavyweights. And it's like, Ryan, you could be getting a super fight against one of these guys next. Just remember, this dude was supposed to be fighting Linton Vassell, who's actually looked on pretty good form. I mean, he's still a deeply flawed fighter, but his recent form has been pretty scary. Um, and now he has to fight a guy who he just watched not defend a takedown, <laughs> just fall over. Uh, Ryan Bader would have a, a laughingly good time fighting Hen and Ferreira. Hen and Ferreira versus Tom Aspinall. I think, you know, Tom Aspinall would really have to fuck that up to fail. And um, Ryan Bader versus Tom Aspinall. Ooh, that's a bit more interesting. Oh, I forgot to do the welterweight one. Um, Magomed Karimov versus... Oh, Amosov just lost, so it's Jason Jackson. That would be a fun fight. Um, and Leon Edwards would murk both of them, because Leon Edwards is actually really, really good. But Magomed Karimov being a, uh, a trips-in-the-clinch kind of guy, and Leon Edwards being a smash-people-with-elbows-coming-out-of-the-clinch kind of guy, that would be a fun matchup. But Jason Jackson, with how easily he was able to shake off Amosov in his fight like two weeks ago, um, Magomed Karimov would have a, a lot on his plate dealing with him. Anyway, so that brings us to the main event, which was Olivier Obim Mercier, who I kept calling OSP last week, but that's Obim St. Prue. He's OAM uh, versus Clay Collard, who has been you know a, a mainstay for uh, PFL. Has great fights every time out. Boxed a bit, had great boxing matches. Was in the UFC for a bit. Had a great fight with Max Holloway when Max Holloway wasn't very famous. Um, so he's another one who sort of went out of the UFC just a little bit early by fighting guys who went on to be very good. But Collard's always great fun. He was doing, um, you know, spamming hands into uh, lead leg calf kicks against the Southpaw OAM. OAM was throwing nice heart, uh, body and head kicks like he normally does. But mainly this was OAM uh, ragdolling him in the clinch. There was some lovely stuff in here. There was a, I mean, I'd, I was going to write about it and then I saw, uh, who is it? Hold on. Is it Open Notes Grappling? Open Note Grappling on Twitter. Um, just picked up on the two things that I actually wanted to talk about. Well, there was about three things I wanted to talk about. The two things that he picked up on already and, and tweeted too much acclaim with an awesome stepping uh, knee to stepping throw from the wizard along the fence uh, by OAM, which was basically just Islam Makachev's knee to uh, Haragoshi, but with OAM's back to the center of the cage rather than the fence. And the beautiful uh, deep half guard entry by Clay Collard when he was mounted. It's uh, a fantastic... Deep, deep half guard's one of those ones that's actually weird because it's harder to get into from half guard or knee shield half guard than it is from bad positions. But it's a really powerful and useful technique and he, he escaped with it wonderfully. The Homer Simpson is what they call that when you uh, dig under the leg and you walk on the floor like Homer Simpson in the end of the episode where he was the union leader. And then the other one was that Clay Collard, in about round four, he actually had a really good round. He'd been struggling with the clinch throughout. Uh, and in the fourth round, he comes out and he's digging underhooks every time OAM does anything. And then he turns him onto the fence and OAM's holding the overhook, trying to, because he can throw off the overhook still with his back to the fence. And uh, Collard's trying to strip the overhook, keep his head against OAM and throw uh, flurries of punches, uh, like you know Nate Diaz versus um, Conor McGregor, John Jones versus... Uh, Global Teixeira DC too. And he fails on the first time because OAM's holding his tricep uh, with his palm and then eventually he gets it and he, he throws a lovely combination of it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a good fight. People were upset though OAM fought boringly, but there was, you know, the best part of a million dollars on the line because it's your purse and then they top you up based on what you're missing from a million dollars by the time you get to the final. OAM is probably not on more than $100,000 for a fight that he wins in PFL. Though Anthony Pettis was on 750. So it's like if he'd gone three fights deep in the tournament or four, you know, three fights deep in the tournament and then got to the final, uh, he'd have made almost $2 million and would he have to pay them back? <laughs> what's the what's the deal there? Um, but it's an interesting way to do it because you've got the, I think it should be a million dollar prize plus your, your purses from the fights. But, uh, you know, it, it's a way to do it a little bit cheaper for them you are still getting a million dollars at the end of the day, even though you're then being taxed on it. But this is the second that OAM's won. And he was he was always good in the UFC. That's the thing. He's a lightweight, so he's in a really strong division. He never looked bad. He's never even been finished. But the, the streak fights he lost, three in a row, got him cut. 
Alexander Hernandez, that's the weakest of them. Gilbert Burns, now welterweight top contender. And Armin Sarukian, lightweight top 10 guy. Or top 15 guy, probably. But yeah, that's you know that's how easy it is to get cut from the um, competitive divisions. His only other loss in the UFC was Diego Ferreira a couple of years earlier. Oh no, Chad Lepree in his very first UFC fight by split decision. But yeah, the whole thing is he was never a bad fighter. And the UFC's sort of strict keeping of three losses and you're out in the competitive divisions. Um, you know, two losses for most people and you're out. Uh, basically saw him go to PFL when he was still, you know, still had a lot more to give and to learn. So he's uh, he's retired now. He's, he said he's retired, uh, which is fair. He's 34, which isn't that. Well, 35 is when it's sort of like the deadline on the lower divisions, most people say. But I think with a, a clinch-heavy style, if you can make the clinches, um, you could probably go a bit older in those divisions. He's a guy who could have longevity. He could hang around for another tournament, win another million dollars. So respect to him for retiring. But yeah, I, I talked about that a lot, but it was a nine-hour event. It was fucking insane how long that went. Because obviously, if you're crowning five champions on one card, you've got five fights that are booked for 25 possible minutes. It's the same when the UFC does like a triple title fight on a card. You go, actually, that's not maybe the best idea. Sometimes it's going to be UFC 217 and it, you know, all the fights end in the first or second round. But other times it can be an hour and a half on just those three fights. And then if you factor in the entrances and all that bollocks, yeah, it's a lot. So then some other stuff happened this weekend. Um, Jamel Charlo came back from two years off due to injuries and mental health stuff. Sorry, I just said Jamel. I said I meant Jamal. We've had a good moan about this before, but Jamal Charlo came back and um, for Jose Benavidez knocked him down in the first round. It was really, yeah, it was, it was a fine fight. He missed weight and he came back heavier for the second weigh-in, which is my favourite move. I didn't see the weigh-in. I hope he flexed on the scales. If you miss weight by a comical amount, you've got to do the double bicep flex. But the interesting one for me was Demetrius Andrade, or, uh, well... It's spelt Andrade, like all the you know all the Brazilian fighters we're used to, but he's American, so I believe they say Andrade. Um, he's been a weird character in boxing, man. He because uh, I remember like I was watching some of his fights when it was uh, I think Unibet asked me like what could be some interesting fights for the year for Canelo, and I was looking at all the guys in the basically like three or four divisions within three or four divisions of him because he could just do whatever he wants. Um, but yeah, Demetrius Andrade has had a weird ass career because he's 35 years old. They keep calling him the 35 year old prospect, you know, facetiously. But he won his first world title at the WBO light middleweight title back in 2013. So for the, for a decade, he has held world t world titles. The weird thing about him is that in the course of holding two world titles, well, three of you include the WBA brackets regular, but you know, it's, it's not really a bell. Um, in the course of holding two world titles and fighting 12 fights over 10 years, he's never met someone who's won a world title previously. Even in winning world titles, he both of them were vacant when he won them. It's crazy to, to have that like level of recognition in terms of accolades and have so little to like back it up once you start asking who he won the belt from and who he defended it against. Um, so David Benavides uh, has been WBC super middleweight champion but he just beat Caleb Plant, you know, who's a, a good fighter. And yeah, this was going to be a big test for Demetrius Andrade. And he was going up in weight. And it was like, this is his chance to prove that he is legit. And he basically, he fought like he was terrified for four rounds. And then in the fourth round, he just stopped throwing punches. It was really weird. Uh, and there was all sorts of talk about like the ref and the ring and stuff and what Benavides had requested and the ref was going to be stricter on clinches because uh, Demetrius Andrade loves a clinch. That's the other thing about him. Like people say that he's got a crap record because he's been ducked and they all, people have even said that like Canelo ducked him because at one point Canelo could have unified another division's belts by fighting Demetrius Andrade and he chose to go up and fight Kovalev instead at light heavyweight. And it's like, no, Demetrius Andrade brings nothing to the table. Even if he's like a difficult fighter, nobody watches him because he can't even fight entertainingly against people who, you know, are bus drivers. But for the first little bit of this Benavides fight, I quite enjoyed what he was doing, circling around the ring, throwing, he's a southpaw, so he's throwing wide lefts to the body, stepping outside the lead foot, 
taking the outside angle, throwing a wide left to the body, and then just double legging the guy. <laughs> he just goes in on the hips and grabs a clinch. And um, for the early going, that was okay. And then the ref started letting that play out a bit more. And Benavidez would, you know, he'd, he'd wrap his hands around Benavidez and then the referee wouldn't break them. And Benavidez would still have his elbows in tight and he'd just start hitting him. And he'd push him off and he'd start hitting his body and stuff. And you could see Demetrius Andrade realize, oh, I'm not safe there. And this is a guy who's got like a real hit and clinch style, really loves just throwing one punch, scoring, making a clinch, be safe, breaking, wasting some time, go and find another punch. So he's reduced sort of circling around the ring and he was um, ducking in for the, for the belt line basically and leaning back. And Benavidez was blasting him just by shooting right straights and long right hooks with his rear hand. He'd throw this big right overhand and sometimes it'd go around the back of Andrade's gloves and sometimes it'd come in over the top like Chuck Liddell versus Overeem, but not as dramatically, come in from right overhead. But the move that I really liked that Andrade was doing was um, he was circling around the ring and then he'd get the inside foot position and throw a big lead hand, so southpaw right uppercut as Benavidez walked onto him. Now, Benavidez was like half a head taller than him and also quite upright. So it didn't really work that well, but it reminded me a lot of Jack Sharkey who did that to Jack Dempsey in their fight. That was orthodox versus orthodox, but I really liked it, Southpaw versus orthodox, getting the inside angle. Uh, if you watch the Kopolov Filthy Casuals guide that I just put out, we were talking about getting the inside angle or at least walking to the inside angle and then stepping outside the lead leg when, you, when, you, um, when the opponent follows you. Um, but yeah, he was doing lots of work with the inside foot position. Um, but yeah, basically, fourth round, he either gets dinged with something or gets worn down by some of these body shots that are being put in, and he just stops throwing punches. And then Benavidez beats him up, and then he went back to his corner at the end of the sixth after having a rough round and said, I'm not going to fight anymore. And that's one of those things is like it does, it can preserve your career, and I respect that about boxing. People will just quit on the stool, and it's not. It. I think MMA has sort of helped people with like fighters quitting because quitting on the stool will save you some trouble. It used to be like you had to get your corner to quit for you. But it's weird because people have seen this and gone like, well, now Dimitri Sondrade will be fighting big names. It's like, I'm not sure he will, you know. Uh, I think he'll probably go back to fighting absolute jabronis. But then at least he doesn't have to protect his record anymore. He's lost the, lost the O, as they always say. And then Super Real Matias fought the weekend, but I haven't caught that yet. But he apparently beat someone up on the inside, which is always fun. Super Real Matias... I included him in my last um, three strikers to watch piece. Does a great, does tons of great infighting, but he has this uppercut on the inside that is like doing a hammer curl. He's got his thumb pointing up and he just dings people under the chin and then left hooks them. But yeah, I think I've gone plenty on a weekend where there weren't many things happening. So uh, sign up to the Patreon. I'll be back in the middle of the week to do the boycast and I might drop something in between then, um, whether it's an article about this weekend's event, which is actually surprisingly good, or... Possibly a bit of Sifu, maybe. Or maybe I'll pull out the big guns and I'll get Snake Eater. If you want to get all the extra stuff, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, thinking about how quickly I could squander a million dollars blessed.